For today's exercise number nine, we will talk about function approximators in prediction as you had in the lecture last week. So in last week's lecture, you transitioned from tabular methods to function approximators because you are now, or we are now operating on continuous state spaces. What does that mean? We don't have a or let's say we might still have a countable number of states which we can visit, but they might be unfeasible large to store them in data, to store an, 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 a state value and state action value for each of them, for each combination in data. Um, another problem, even if you had enough data, is with these tabular methods that you actually have to visit each state in order to be able to derive some kind of estimation for the um, for the values you've got there. So for today, what will we do? We will have an environment. Um, I think um, Dr. Walscheid even mentioned it in the lecture, the mountain car, which cannot be seen here at the moment for whatever reason. Okay, that's... Everything was almost fine until uh, we couldn't see the mountain car. Let me see if we open it again. Okay, the GIF is gone, so maybe we can see it in the source. I think it's, it's important. If you haven't seen the notebook yet, it might be a good idea to have a look. What are we looking at? Um, so just as the inverted pendulum, we are now looking at a car. Ah, here it is, perfect. So this is our environment. We have a car which is starting randomly somewhere in this here uh, in this area here, and its goal is to reach this flag. Um, it can do this by either accelerating to the left accelerating to the right or doing nothing. So we have three actions. This is countable. This is still, this does not have to be approximated. However, what do we have as states? We have the position of the car from, I think, minus 0.6 to 0.6. Let me see again. We probably have this defined here somewhere. Uh, at the bottom, I think, not so optimal. Mm, we have Minus point 1.2 point here for the minimum position and point 0.6 for the maximum position, which is just here at the border and minus point 0.12 is uh, here at the border. So our goal is to have the mountain kite position 0.5. That's just speaking mathematically. Visually, we want to have the mountain car to the right. So this is, you kind of have to build up the momentum so that your car is able to reach up there. This is like the inverted pendulum where you have to swing left, swing right, until you are finally able to reach your the upper point or physically to have enough energy in your system so that you can finally reach your goal. And for this, as I mentioned, we have three different actions. Uh, accelerate left, accelerate right, or do nothing at all. So let me maybe... Exactly. So, so tabular, tabular methods are not able to be uh, applied here, uh, used here, because we have a continuous state space. What we could do is we could discretize, discretize each of these small steps and then try to use the tabular methods for, for this. However, um, we want also want to use uh, the good properties of function approximators, which are able to inter and extrapolate. However, extrapolation is often not so good. Uh, yet we are able to interpolate to states which we have not visited during our exploration phase. Um, we will see this later and also the downfall uh, for this. So for this lecture, as we as we have no control problem here, all we do is a prediction. Um, we have a fixed policy, uh, which is given in the code. So what we want to do is we want to evaluate um, its value functions using function approximators. And the reward is given as minus one for every step. So every step, the episode last, we get a negative reward. Uh, until the episode ends. So what does that mean? The longer we need until we finally reach our goal, the worse our reward is. So 
We want to reach our goal as soon as possible. However, we will not change the policy today. So that's what you've learned in today's lecture, which will be done in the next exercise. What we will do today instead is just evaluate a given one. So, uh, for this, yeah, we have here some coach, just I will not go too much in detail with the coach as usual, only to the important snippets, but here we have our imports. And here in this uh, cell, if you're interested, you can, you can visualize the car yourself and what happens if you take some random actions. So the car will not, is not able to get out of this uh, hole, or how do you say it? Uh, between the hills, the area, it's not able to escape from that just by doing random actions. So yeah, the first, approximation which we you were supposed to do or which we are discussing today is a linear function approximation which we will try to estimate our value function at every stage uh, for every state and so we are not estimating the value action function but instead the value function how how much is the expected reward in each state so the Linear function approximation is given here. Basically, it's just the state vector multiplied by some weight vector. So, uh, weight, yeah, weight vector. Just as you know, some linear combination of the states, state variables with each other. Um, so, this is basically, uh, yeah, this is basically our estimator here. And we are using a feature vector, which, uh, as we discussed last week, we can derive from the observation from the state which we have, so from the um, position and from the velocity uh, which are given, um, we can derive many different features, which we will also do here. Um, and the task was to write a semi-gradient semi TD0 prediction algorithm using this function approximation. And I don't know whether Dr. Weisheit set anything to the evaluation which you did last week so we already got the results and we saw the results and um, one uh, a few of the uh, the comments were that live coding is not very interesting however it might be interesting to take to have the code be as close as possible to the pseudo algorithms. So what I will try to do today is go step by step through the pseudo algorithms and show to you how they are implemented in the code and the rest will be it. I'm not doing any live coding, I agree. I think that's very boring. I wouldn't do it. And we cannot do it with these notebooks anyway since execution takes quite some time. Okay. What's also important as mentioned in the text that the so I think, ah, yeah, the, um, the, to make features, the first task was to make features here for this semi-gradient TD0 using linear approximator. And what was given in the task was that the terminal vector is supposed to be a zero vector, so each state should be zero. And I think uh, a hint was that the car's energy is important. Uh, maybe you, like me, would read it, okay, what's the car's energy? I, I listened to the YouTube video from the last time this exercise was held, and it seems it means kinetic energy and potential energy, which makes a lot of sense. I felt very dumb afterwards. And that the potential energy kind of scales with the height. So where is our um, mountain car currently located? So that's its potential, it would usually go down, and its current momentum or its current velocity into some direction. Uh, I think the kinetic energy is one half mass, mass times velocity squared. I looked that up too, basically. <laughs> so what, what do we have here for the solution as a possible feature vector? So this is our feature vector here. Um, the winning condition, as I mentioned before, is when we are to the right of the position point 0.5. So basically the position point 0.5 is uh, this flag which we want to reach. And to the right of it, we won. That's fine. We, we did it. So basically what we do here, we have this feature vector and we multiply it with uh, 1 
if win is zero and win is zero if we haven't reached the state yet and we multiply it with zero if win is one and win one is one when we have reached the goal. That's it. So basically this makes the whole vector zero as soon as we are on the goal. That's the solution for this part. The other uh, components are for our feature vector are an offset, the one, or sometimes I think in neural networks it would be a bias, something which you can add on your uh, uh, on your linear combination of your features, you always have this. Then you have the position and velocity as given by the observation and the state. Then, as I mentioned, we have velocity squared because it's, um, because it's a kinetic energy, because it's part of the kinetic energy of our mountain car. And we have, and now it gets a little more sophisticated, uh, I didn't know why we would do sinus and cosinus of the position, three times the position either, when I first saw this notebook. I listened to the YouTube video and it seems like the sinus is from the height and the height was gathered, how to calculate the height was gathered from the source code. Where do I have it? So we don't need this anymore, I think. From the source code of the environment. So. You can scroll down, this is a source code, you can scroll down here and you can find, let me see, here we have this height function and it's sinus three times the position and the cosinus was derived from the step function. Basically the step function is always called with an action where we, call, uh, where we apply our action and here we can see in this here in the velocity update function, we have this cosinus of three times the position. I think for this lecture, for this exercise, it's fine that we did it this way. However, in real life, you don't have a source code in which you can look. And usually, yeah, so since we do have all the information about the environment which we need, it's easy to maybe design a perfect policy or we could easily help our agents a lot by just taking a look at the source code and getting gathering the right information from that. You wouldn't do that in reality. In reality, you might have a system which you have some information about, which you will try to incorporate. Maybe you have some um, PDEs, for example, partial differ differential equations, and you somehow try to incorporate them into your agent, into your features, but you don't have full system knowledge as we have now. Uh, other methods might be more useful there. However, nonetheless, I've kept this feature vector and this is it basically. You might have, if you have coded yourself here and you have a different feature vector, this might be as fine as well. Um, Maybe, Maybe you got an even better result from the final uh, look at it. Okay. Sorry? I think that's what we always are. Uh, isn't I think that's what we always have in linear systems. So this is where, when you think of a linear of a line, just one x and one y. No, and you have a linear combination between these two, the offset would be where, when x is zero, where on the y line you are. So you often need this offset or you, to perfectly describe your data. So it's, you, you usually always have this kind of um, so value. So basically our model will learn a, a weight which is just added on all linear combinations in the end. So the one is multiplied by a weight. We just have an, an additional weight to our vector. Um, okay. okay, and, and then, then we will go to the semi-gradient TD0. I will sit for this because I will go line by line so that you can understand where you can find what and what's important here. So for the implementation, for the pseudo code, let me quickly find it. So this is the algorithm of semi-gradient TD0. And what we can see is, what do we need? We need a policy to be evaluated. Okay, so we have a policy here, here given by this function. This shouldn't be altered by you, this is just given. Uh, basically, what does this policy do? It accelerates to the left 
uh, if we are already ex if, if we are already going to the left and we are accelerating to the right, if we are already going to the right to build up some energy and be able to swing up. This is not a perfect policy. That isn't supposed to be a perfect policy. It's just for our evaluation. Okay, so we have our policy. We have a feature presentation x dash, uh, which is a function of x. We discussed this right now. And we need a differential function where the function of the terminal x is zero. So that's, this, is, this is our function here, this w transpose time x. This is our uh, differentiable function. This is differentiable uh, to w. And uh, if we un un unplug, plug in, so we plug in the terminal vector, which is just zero, this whole term becomes zero since it's just a multiplication with zero. So this point here is fulfilled too. Great. So what else do we need? We need the step size between zero and one. I'm not sure. Ah, yeah, this was also already given. We have an alpha here. Uh, we also have already given the number of episodes and in gamma. Okay, great. So we should, first step is we have we should initialize, initialize our weights randomly or arbitrarily. So how did we do this here? We have here this w. This is our weight vector and we only set it to all zeros. That's it. So in this case, that's fine. We can just have it all zeros. For some models, this wouldn't be possible, for example, in neural networks. However, for this, it's fine. Oh, I can close this. Okay, now what do we have? We loop over the episodes. Uh, here we have it too. We have a loop over the episodes. Okay, that's great. So far, so boring. Initialize the x, x0, which is our initial state. I think you probably already had another exercise which already told you how to do this. So when you, we are once again working with a gymnasium, environment and you always just have to call its reset function. So this is a common API and then you can derive the initial state x0. We might in the future call it x0 here to have it less confusing. Nah, we cannot. We just want to work with the state name here and there. But we could call it x maybe in the future. Okay, next. Now we want to iterate over the time steps in each episode. However, in our case, we don't, don't know how long an episode is, since it could terminate earlier or later. It terminates as soon as we have reached the flag. So an episode could have more or less steps. That's why we don't have a for loop here, but instead we just have a while loop. We just continue as long as, as we have to, and as soon as we are done, we stop. Okay. So that's it. Then, then we have, have get, get, we want to get, get the action, and, and okay, we, we, have, we want to have, the, we want to get an action and we want to apply the action from the policy. How do we do that? First of all, we can call the policy, we can take the state, call the policy and get an action, and then we call nth point step, which is also basic API from gymnasium. And probably in all reinforcement learning, you will always work with these, um, these names. So reset step when something is done. So we call nth point step from the action and we observe the next state and the reward. And what's kind of new is these terminated and truncated flags. Um, which are both basically, with both, which both mean the episode is done, but for different reasons. So either by the, the environment is really done, we have reached some goal or some catastrophic state, or by, okay, we have said that an episode should end after 500 steps and that's it. So we have two different steps, uh, flags for that now. And, and I kind of don't know which one is which, honestly, by now, since it's the first time I'm working with this new API too. But basically, you can derive done by taking an or combination here. Okay, so that was also this. We have the next. We applied the action. We observed the next state and the reward. 
Now we have these, rage. And now we do this update here, which is quite a long, um, yeah, which is quite a long line. I think, yes, I've added it in just one line. That's what, that would be how it would look if I would actually implement it line per line. However, Sometimes this might be a very long line and also it might not be the best idea to do it line for line. That's why we try to implement it more like this here so that we break it up in the line and have smaller values calculated first. So um, that's just the idea behind it. So basically what we do is, what do we need? We have Let's, Let's see, we want, want to have, we want to change our vector w and do it by taking w again plus alpha times and then the reward plus gamma times uh, the value of the next stage. So next feet w times next feet next state. So, so our next... <coughs> To, to estimate the value of our next state, we would once again have to call our estimator, which is, um, which is just w, its weight, times the state. So in this case, if we want to have the value of the next state, we calculate w times next state. Then we want to subtract the estimation of our estimator for the current state. And the estimation of our current state is once again w times the current state. And in the end, we want to multiply by this different by the value function at state x differentiate but differentiate 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 it. Thank you. <laughs> differentiate it by w. And in our case. It's just our estimate is maybe so our estimate is oh no let's see me first I think it's W transpose time x right so, uh, yeah okay so our estimate at this one let me do it clearly. So we so so basically, this is our estimator, our linear estimator which is estimating our value function at x state k, x k. And now we want to differentiate, thank you again, <laughs> this. And by the way, sorry for my bad handwriting. It's not made for lectures or exercises. Uh, So basically, if we just take our linear estimator and differentiate it to the weight vector w, we just get our current state, just a linear differentiation here. So what we have here for the last position in our code is just the current state. So here we are. We multiply once again just with our current state. And that's it. That's the whole algorithm. And here on the upper lines, you can check yourself. We did exactly this line, just split up in some more calculations. That's all. What else did we do here? We saved the visitor's states just to have some visualization later. And we have to change the, the state k plus 1 to the current state when we transition in time. That's all. And so when we have done this, we can execute it and derive some 
weight vector by it. We have plotted this here, these values. You don't have to really see what these mean. They are just the values which will now be multiplied with our state vector at each step. So I think the next task was, I think in the future, I will give you this code beforehand and so that you know that you have some visualization given and you only need to implement the algorithm. So what we have here is some visualization of the, the B values by some, yeah, something like a heat map, I would say, um, given by the state vectors. So the position from minus point to 2.6 and from minus 0.06 or 0.07, I guess, to 0.07 to the plus side, and how our linear estimator estimated the value functions here. And what we can see is, well, going from 0.5, everything is zero. That's not because our estimator is able to estimate this perfectly, but because our feature vector is all zero there, so it automatically becomes zero. But what we can already see, which is good, is that the closer we are to the finish line from the position, the better. Okay, might be, might be fine to uh, guess that. However, some states seem to be very strange. For example, even if you are very close to the finish line and you have a negative velocity, you would go away from the finish line and if you remember how our how our um, setup looked you would go down the hill and probably up the hill on the other side so these states here are very bad they are not good however our estimator tells us these are good values for some reason so we see some regions might might be good or let's say better estimated some are not so good we can let's see what the next plot is we can also plot these three dimensionally so that we kind of see especially for these dark blue areas can have a better feeling how they are distributed from the height and what we also see what's a little strange is for some reason here in this area, in this, in this left side position, we have higher value function than here in the middle. It, um, even for low velocities, this makes also no sense. Maybe for high velocities, because if you, have high, uh, if you have a high velocity and are here, you could go back and all the way up. That would make sense. Yeah, and what we can also observe is because we have, that we have this jump to, uh, to the zero value where our state vector is zero and to from the other values here. But, uh, so this is quite a steep jump here. Um, I think that's not so bad for control later on. However, it might not look so nice. Okay, and, and what we've also plotted here is, so maybe we could actually understand what is happening. Maybe I should have shown this plot first is where we have actually, where is our policy actually visiting the states? So here in the middle, where we have no velocity yet, is our possible starting position. So we have the small frame where we randomly start, and then our uh, um, um, where our position is already negative, our velocity is zero, and our agent the policy of our agent will start to accelerate to the left always since that's just how it's programmed and so what we can see is depending on the starting position we will go a little bit left 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 then we fit then we go going up a little bit of the to the hill and then uh, gravity will bring us back and we will have some positive acceleration and depending on the starting position some, in some cases, the agent will already reach the final goal here. So it could go quite fast. However, for some, if, if let's say if the starting position is not so favorable, we will, are not able to go up to the, to the hill, up to the hill to the fullest, and we'll go back by gravity again. And see here with a lot of acceleration here, go back and hit a wall. So we go right to the left and we have hit a wall and what happens, our velocity becomes zero immediately since we've hit a wall. 
And then that's why we don't have a spread here anymore. All of these cases now have the same velocity, the same position, and since our policy is fixed and no randomness is inside, we have no more spread and we will slowly reach the final goal on this path. And what we can see kind of for this, that means for this policy, we would kind of expect here some better values since the best values we have are when we have, a, uh, when the and then the policy is able to reach the goal quickly here, so very little minus points. And then we might have some kind of better uh, estimation here in the upper, upper region too, since here we are guaranteed to reach our goal. And as we can see, the linear approximation is unable to show any of this. Okay, any questions so far? Good. Okay. Bless you. Um, then the next task was to now instead of use this linear approximation, to use another linear approximation, to use linear, uh, to, use to use recursive least squares TD, um, where we now don't have this alpha update value, but instead a possible forgetting factor um, and these, yeah, we are updating the least squares method also step by step. And what's also a condition here is that we have an our feature vector, uh, that the terminal vector has to be zero and the task was to use different forgetting factors. Basically, if we, this lambda I think it's optional if we use one, that means we are not forgetting anything while we update on our algorithm online. And if we use some values lower than one, we start to forget some of the older states. Um, and that's especially important for dynamic environments, which we kind of don't have here. Nonetheless, uh, we wanted that you somehow evaluate or see what happens if you try to play a little bit with this forgetting factor and see how the results change. And also you need to have lots of practice how to implement these pseudo codes, obviously. Okay, so for this, we once again need this feature vector, uh, which is just the same as before, there is some um, normalization option in here. As we have discussed last week, normalization might be a good idea sometimes, often. We will see later. Uh, I will show you why this might be a good idea here. Nonetheless, I have not, for this notebook, I have not normalized the features here. But I will show you why it might be a good idea. Um, exactly. But Besides this, we don't have any difference in the feature vector. And now we are supposed to implement our algorithm here. So once again, let me go to the um, lecture. Where do we have it? Because of least squares, here it is. So we have because of least squares TD. What do we need? We need a policy. As we said, we already have this. We need a feature representation. We have this. We need a forgetting factor. We have three different ones which we want to evaluate. So we have this. Um, we want to initialize the weights arbitrarily. And we want to have a covariance P which is bigger than zero. And as an example was uh, here taking the uh, beta, beta times uh, what do you say, U unit matrix, um, unity matrix, I think, identity matrix, identity matrix, that's, that's the official name. Ah, yeah, here it's encode too. So basically what have we done again? We initialized W with zeros and we initialized the identity matrix just with the SE identity. Uh, so we initialized P, sorry, here it's P, as the identity matrix, so beta is one in this case. Um, okay, so I will skip the things we've done before. So what do we do? We have to iterate over episodes. We initialize x0. Okay, we already know how to do this. 
we go over the time steps. Once again, we don't know how long the episodes are, so we will have a while loop. We apply the action and then we do some magic here. So let's take a look here in the coach. So we have done, we have applied the action. We will set y to the next reward, as can be seen here. Then we will set c transposed to x transposed minus gamma x k plus 1 transposed. I think we can, in Python, we don't need to do the transposing. So we just have feed state minus gamma times feed next state. Then we have c to p times c divided by lambda plus c transposed p times c. That's quite a lot to say. <laughs> So you can find this line here. And I think I will not talk too much about it anymore. The next two lines are just as they are in the side of coach. I will not tell you any more about this. And then once you have implemented this, the loop is almost roughly the same. You only had to change this update rule here. That's quite nice. Not much to change. And you can go, uh, what I did is I, I think this is not in the solutions notebook, which are uploaded. I might upload my version later. Uh, I just iterated over the lambdas, which we had to calculate so that I have all of them today here. So I just iterated over all lambdas so that we can, yeah, see the results in one cell. Mm. The first thing I've plotted and also just to show why normalization might be interesting or better to do, I plotted the W's for uh, which were the results for each of the recursive least squares algorithms. So we can see this is for uh, um, lambda equals Z, uh, 1, this is for lambda equals 0.99 and this is for lambda equals 0.9 and what we can see is that for lambda less than one, some of the values seem to be quite large. And these make sense because the third value is our velocity and the fourth value is our velocity squared. Let me show you maybe. And where do we have it? Here. Ah, we didn't, I wouldn't have to go this much to the top. Here we have it. So. Our third is velocity and our fourth is velocity squared. And velocity goes from minus 0.07 to 0 0.07, so which is very low. And velocity squared would be even lower then. So what does it mean? We need very high values which we multiply with these if, we, if they are somehow impactful. And so if we would have normalized these values, the weight vector wouldn't have to grow this large. And Usually, sometimes, or maybe even often, when you have these large vectors, they might be a hint towards overfitting. So it might be a better idea to do some normalization here. Nonetheless, for, the lecture, for this exercise, it's fine to just take a look at the results. And so, oh, sorry. So I just plotted all of these below each other. First of all, for lambda equals 1, the color map or mesh grid kind of looks very, very similar to the linear one. So it's also a linear model. Um, however, we don't see much change. What we can observe is when we take a look at the 3D plane, that it looks a little less steep of a jump here to closer to the goal line. However, still very close to our linear model. When we take a look at our forgetting factor, 0.99, um, where we have used the forgetting factor 0.99, what we can see is that we have here in this upper half a little better values than before, which also makes much sense. So we have a high acceleration, we are very close to the, to the goal, so we expect better values. Nonetheless, here, even though we had in this area also lots of samples, uh, lots of episodes going right into the goal, we um, here we still don't have high values, so still not so good. Uh, here we can also see quite a changed uh, 3D map, which is also nice. So 
what we can observe here now better is that in the positive velocity half, we have higher values, which is also expected. So this is not so bad. This is, all, this is already better, even though we do have a non-dynamic environment, the forgetting factor seems to have some impact. And I think for lambda equals 0 0.9, we have quite a similar result, yes. Okay. Any questions so far? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think it's, yeah, that's a good question. It's because of the numerical calculations which we do here. I don't want to give a wrong answer now. Basically what we do here is we divide by lambda uh, in two occasions, or let's say at least here in this occasion. So, so when, when lambda, lambda is smaller than one, one this grows. And, and this, this might, might be the reason why weight work vectors, vectors are even able to grow further. Lambda. However, I'm not exactly sure, I cannot tell you. So, so I would have to guess now too, I would have to look it up. Uh, I, think I think the question is interesting. interesting. I will have um, the exercise in two weeks again. So I would ask or look it up and tell you then. Okay. But I thought about it too. I think it has something to do with this numerical calculations which we do here and but I'm not too much of an expert uh, regarding least squares or recursive least squares methods either. So I will have to ask too. Okay, another question? Mm. Good. Good, then, then well, what I know, sorry, sorry. What, what, what I just remembered, remembered from the YouTube, YouTube video, video, I think in recursive least squares, squares when, you don't have an, when you don't have a forgetting factor, convergence, convergence is guaranteed, so you converge to a specific weight vector, and, and when you have it lower than one, you don't have these convergence, convergence guarantees or properties, so, so it might diverge to higher values. So, so why, why exactly this happens? This has to be some mathematical reason. However, this I think is the reason why, why we see these, reason, uh, these weights diverging and not converging. But I will, I will tell you again in more detail in two weeks. Okay, so for the last exercise, I I think the, yes, the approximation was already given since we don't have an algorithm for this in the lecture and I think this was also just done by hand. We want to do the nonlinear function approximation using artificial neural networks, so a little bit like we did last week. We want to estimate the value function directly, so this is kind of like a regression problem, problem. sorry. And here, for the neural networks, um, normalization is quite important, so we do it beforehand. I think this was also just the task for this exercise, so that you normalize uh, the state. Uh, here it was done using a min-max scaler, and since a normal min-max scaler scales from 1 to 0 and not from minus 1 to 1, um, we multiply this scaling from one from zero to one by two, so it's then scaled from zero to two, and subtract one so that it's scaled from minus one to one. That is all that is happening here. So you can look it up at home yourself if you want to. And what do we do here? We use TensorFlow. And I guess that's Keras also again. Uh, Keras. Uh, syntax. Okay, I would have to look it up again at the top. However, what we do here is we initialize a sequential model. So basically, uh, how we do it here, it's a feed-forward network where we put a layer after layer and we add these layers to the model. So we start with a layer with 16 units or 16 new ones, new ones and the input dimension is true. So we do not any feature engineering here. Um, we add another layer of 16 and then uh, 
output layer of one since we just estimate one uh, value function. And we also have some nonlinear active, I think you had it in Wilhelm's lecture too. So we use the real, real, ReLU uh, activation function in the, in the hidden layers um, to have some nonlinear estimation here. And the reason why we don't use feature engineering here is to show you yeah, we could use feature engineering here too, it wouldn't hurt at all. As we've seen last week, feature engineering can also help for neural networks, especially when they are small. But what we want to show you in this exercise is that we have in our last layer, we have only one new one and we have a linear activation. So this is not nonlinear. So basically what we have here, if we just take this last row, this is a linear estimator. and the um, the layers before are nonlinear um, functions. So basically what we are doing in the first layers is we are transforming our data into some nonlinear space, somehow some combinations, and then we do a linear estimation on them. And so what we are doing is we give our feature engineering to the neural network and let it do it. So basically what the neural net network is doing here could be done by us too, but we don't know how. And that's why we have a neural network do it. Um, nonetheless, it's always helpful to think about feature engineering because when you do good features that might, or when you design your model based on your knowledge, that might uh, decrease training time, that might boost performance on smaller networks, even on bigger ones, which tend to overfitting. So even this, understand this just as showing you that this can be understood as feature engineering done automatically in a black box manner. However, doing it white box by doing it yourself is also a good idea, I think, always. Okay, nonetheless, we have done no feature engineering here. What do we also need? We need an optimizer where we have stochastic gradient descent uh, with a learning rate alpha. I think that's given here, yes. And we will evaluate on the mean squared error. And apart from this, we, as you already know, we have the same um, structure as always, call, reset an environment, get, uh, call the policy, get an action, take, take the step on the environment, and so on and so forth. This is always the same in reinforcement learning. You will see this kind of structure again and again and again, and it's the best, that, uh, it's good if you memorize it already. And, yeah, yeah, so, so now, now for the neural network, we need a target uh, to, to derive, uh, yeah, we need a target value to uh, evaluate how well our network is estimating the value function, and our target will be the reward plus plus gamma times the next value, and the next value is the model called on the next state, so basically the next estimate of our value. If, if we are not at the terminal state, if we are at the terminal state, the target is just the reward, since at the terminal, uh, terminal state, our value function is just the reward. Um, and then what we are doing here is we are using from TensorFlow this gradient tape function. So this might be very confusing for those who have not worked with TensorFlow. I like to work with PyTorch more too, because I think it's confusing too, and I feel it's unintuitive. However, I've heard it was even worse in the past, so take it for what it is, it's already better. So when you work with TensorFlow, you have to tape your gradients so as that you observe them as it seems. So in the past, you were not able to even observe your gradients or alter them. So what you can call, you can call these TensorFlow gradient tape as tape, then you can get the prediction from your model and calculate the loss. And in our case, the loss is a mean squared error from the target to the prediction. So basically, what do we do? We have our model estimate the value function, and we expect the value function to be the same as the reward, reward plus gamma times the next value. And then after we've done this, we can use our optimizer uh, Yes, we have to calculate the gradients 
using the loss on our trainable variables from the model and then we can apply the gradients on our using the optimizer on our model and this this is, is looking a little bit complicated. complicated. I would also recommend to use PyTorch. Maybe, Maybe we'll, we will in the future change this year, um, since, since TensorFlow can be quite confusing. So if you have not yet worked a lot with neural networks and are thinking about starting to do it, the best way to start is PyTorch. I really, it's, I think it's easier to tra transition the other way later because you have a much deeper understanding on how it works and then you will scratch your head why is TensorFlow doing it so complicated when it's possible to do it much easier. However, this is how it could, can be done in TensorFlow and I think the next notebooks will also work with TensorFlow. So, um, yeah, decide for yourself. There are many, many... Um, examples for reinforcement learning and deep reinforcement learning examples in the internet for different frameworks. Um, you can always look it up if you think one framework is too difficult for you. Uh, there are more than enough examples for other frameworks too. Don't need to work with a complicated one. Mm. Okay, but that's it. So basically we are doing here an estimation of the value function. And this, this is, is, oh, you can't see it anymore. A widget could not be displayed. Okay, that's great. So I think this took around 30 minutes on my laptop. So this was quite long, it took a lot of time. This is much slower than all of the other methods presented today. As always, neural networks take their time. And we can, after training, observe how the neural network did decide on its value functions. So what we can see is, um, we have here in this upper right region a much, yeah, let's say more logical distribution, or it makes more sense to have higher values in this upper right corner here compared to where we have this negative velocity, even though the neural network has also no observations from down here. It seems to, to be able to predict better for these su a few samples which we're able to get here, that this is a good region, as well as this upper right region. Nonetheless, also neural network could um, have some horrible um, extrapolation abilities. So we shouldn't trust its, uh, its uh, how it's uh, estimating the value functions in areas it has not seen too much since as we can already see uh, it's getting a little lighter here too so it thinks it, this, these might be better areas than these however these are bad areas too mm. well, in, the, in the bottom right corner nonetheless this is already looking much better but we can also see this is deep black here and I think this can be seen much even better in the 3D plot. So having a high negative velocity and being much far to the left is really bad. And our network was able to uh, actually see that and estimate really bad uh, value values uh, for this, state values for these states. And actually what we can see on the positive velocity side, uh, they are a little higher then on the negative velocity side um, over all of the uh, positional, over the whole positional line. This makes also a lot of sense. So what we also don't have, we don't have any jumpy in estimation. The reason for this is that our terminal vector is not zero here. So we did not know feature engineering. That means um, our network did not know that everything to the right of 0.5 is actually this terminal state, unless uh, the linear estimators did know, did know that, since we did the feature engineering, uh, the neural network did not know that. That's why we have, that's why we have here, going up from 0.5, we don't have this zero area here, which we could observe in, in the linear models here. Uh, this line comes from our feature engineering. Okay, so just from, from the feeling, it seems like this estimate is better than the linear ones or closer to what's actually, might actually be, be the values of the states. However, all of this does not give us anything if we don't, do not do any control 
I think, I would assume. Um, and this will be done next week using both uh, using these estimations of the value function, but still in a, in a, in an action space which is countable. So I think in, tr in the next week you will have policy estimation in the lecture. So what the next step would be after this that the actions also become um, not discrete but continuous. And then you will not only have to estimate the value function but also the policy which, is, uh, which makes things a lot more complicated. Nonetheless, for now we, have, we had our policy given. Um, we estimated the value functions in a continuous state space. Um, do we have any more questions? Great. Then next week's exercise will be held by Daniel. Some of you have mentioned in your evaluation that you liked his lectures or exercises, so be happy. He will be here. He will have the exercise. I will be again here in two weeks. And yeah, hope to see you all then again and wish you a nice evening. Bye-bye.